Now, though, we need to move on to our next guest, because time is of the essence. And our next guest is Diana Bishop. Uh, Diana is a renowned national and international TV news correspondent and producer. Uh, Business Now is the success story program, and she specializes in helping leaders raise their profiles and communication skills. Diana is the granddaughter of Billy Bishop, Canada's most decorated First World War I fighter ace and the author of Living Up to the Legend. And as Rotary is quite often one of the best kept secrets, Diana is going to help us tell our story and explain how powerful it can be. And she's got along with her three of our three storytellers today that she's been mentoring. So please give another big warm Zoom welcome to Diana Bishop, live from a studio in Collingwood. Over to you, Diana. And it, good morning, everybody. And it's a little chilly here, too. <laughs> um, I'm so delighted to be part of this conference and uh, to talk to you about the power of storytelling. And Chris certainly gave us some great examples of, his, uh, of that, including his son, who looks like he's going to be a real star. But this is a subject that is very, very dear to my heart. Um, it's been a solid theme in, in my family and my life. And in fact, I've made an entire career out of it. So I've been doing, as Tony mentioned, I've been doing communications work now for a number of years. But before that, I was for more than 20 years uh, a, a TV news correspondent where, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put up some pictures to make this a little bit more interesting for you. There we go. See if that works. Everybody can see that, I hope. Anyway, as you can see from the pictures, I ended up traveling all over the world. Uh, covering news events of all kinds. And I worked my way up from local reporter to national news to foreign correspondent. And I got to also go to the American networks for NBC News for a couple of years. Um, I interviewed everybody from Nelson Mandela to Celine Dion, from presidents to prime ministers, from business people, ballet dancers, surgeons, to the homeless. And it's been such a rewarding experience because I learned so much about people, but also so much about stories. So in the very short time that we have together, I just wanted to maybe bring to you the essence of what I've learned um, as, as a storyteller. And I've kind of boiled it down to, to three key points. So I'm just gonna go through these and bear with me while I change a slide here. So these are things that you already know, but I think it's important to underline them, especially if you wanna start looking at how your organization is gonna tell your stories sort of in this new era. So first of all, this is no surprise to anybody, but people love stories. You know, we think of storytelling when we read a book or we go to a movie because it's entertainment. So stories are entertainment, but they are entertainment because they organize material in a way that our brains love. They're putting things, making it relatable, all the things that are here, believable, evocative, emotive, it's contagious, inspiring, important, useful, all of those things. And did you know it's scientifically proven that stories are what the brain attaches to better in terms of communication. So it's how we communicate best. Engage us, and it really engages us. And, and, and it's because it's emotion. We, from telling a story, we get trust, compassion, and empathy. And so I've done a lot of work over the years with, with people on both sides of the camera. And what I found is that storytelling really builds connection. Because it's becoming, and business is learning this, they've done, been really adopting storytelling in the last 10 years or so. They find it's the best way, and I, I truly believe for most organizations, it's the best way to teach, to inform, to engage, and to influence. The second thing is that stories really have impact. So did you know that telling a story, organizing material, material in that exciting way, are 22 times more memorable than facts? So case in point, what do you think your audience would prefer to hear about or read about? The fact that, that you raised 68,000 US dollars, which I'm not undermining that, that is an incredible amount of money, to bring drinkable water to 10,000 people in a town or city somewhere in Central Afri Africa? Or would they like to hear the story about this little boy and his family and how they, this little boy and his family personally benefited from having drinkable water, water for the first time, and probably how that changed this little boy's future. So the facts are still important, but it's the story that has the power, 22 times more memorable. Think of the power of that. 
And I used to get teased relentlessly by my editors about this. No bad stories. I would come back from a press conference and say, you know what, it wasn't much of a story there. I don't think we should do that story for the evening news. And the editor would wag a finger at me and say, you know what, Diana, there are no bad stories, just bad storytellers. So that hit me pretty hard. I didn't like that. But over the years, I saw really what they were talking about is that there's literally a story in everything. You might just have to dig a little deeper. So a lot of the stories, look at these wonderful pictures that all, all come from your different websites. And I went and looked at a lot of what you're doing and just incredible stuff. And there's a check, you know, the checks are wonderful, but what's the story behind the story? So storytelling is like anything else. It's a skill and it can be learned. And I'm going to illustrate that to you today with a couple of examples of, of people who are going to tell you their stories. But I'm also going to provide you with a tool that I call the storytelling model that I developed that can help you tell your stories and, and come up with winning stories. But before I do that, you know, I really do know that, that Rotary is probably one of the most fertile organizations in the world for stories. And this is very exciting. But there's still a, you know, a couple of kind of popular misconceptions about telling stories that I hear a lot from people. And I've kind of boiled those down to, to three big things. First about most people I know, my clients included, are kind of modest about telling their story. They don't want to boast about themselves. They, they do incredible work and they're very humble and modest about it. But they feel that if they tell their story, they might be boasting. That it might be coming out, it's, it's too much self-serving. So what I want to tell you about that is that, you know, in this day and age, and especially now after what we've been going through, you can't assume that people know your story. People know Rotary as a wonderful organization, but they don't really know everything that you do or how you do it. And they want to hear it. I think really now, more than ever, we want to hear these inspiring stories. So you kind of have to get over that. If you're feeling that way about being a little modest about your story, I'm going to tell you, just as you know, Chris was sort of saying, it might be giving you a little bit of fear or in discomfort, get past it, because people really do want to hear your story. The second thing I hear a lot is that the media is not looking for good news stories. Now, I'm sure you've all had some success with the local media, maybe in your area, telling your story. And that may have been a bit of a focus for you to think that's where you should tell it. But as a junior reporter, I especially remember this, I was put on the human interest beat for about six months, where I was doing everything from school pageants to a moose that got loose in the St. Lawrence River, which was actually a pretty good story. <laughs> and I could have mined a story from your organization every night of the week, I think. But the key was, we don't just want to hear about the facts, as I said earlier. We want to know about the people that are being impacted by what you do. And if that's the only message we get through to today, is that the impact of what you're doing is the story, the story behind the facts. And the third one is, you know, the media is the only place to tell your story. A lot of people think that, but I would really rephrase this and say the media is just one place to tell your story. There really are two more important places to tell your story, and these are obvious, but sometimes we forget, and that is to your target market. Who is your target market? You know, new members, donors, people in the community. Those are the people that you should be telling your story to directly. You don't have to need, you don't even need the media to do that. And especially now, because there are so many tools out there with social media, with Facebook and Instagram and you name it, they're, they're out there where you can tell your story directly to your audience. And that's having more impact now than ever before. But the other place, the other, and I think it's the best place to start by telling your story, is to tell the story to each other. So, and we often forget that this is our biggest audience, is the people that are already members, the people that are there for you to go and hear a story, a good story, and then take it out into the community and tell it to other people. That's how you kind of get things out there. So let's start there, because I want to introduce you now, and I hope they're all online here, we're going to figure this out, but I'm going to introduce you to three people who have your Rotary Clubs to thank for some really unique opportunities that they've had, opportunities that they wouldn't have gotten elsewhere and that have profoundly, profoundly changed their lives. 
And I'm not going to tell you about them. I'm going to let them introduce them, themselves. So hopefully we've got the first one up here. She's a young woman from Port Elgin. And she was lucky enough to take part in one of Rotary's unique offerings to expand her horizons and her life. So let's bring in, if we can, Brian, Jessica Carter. Jessica, are you there? There she is. Good morning. My name is Jessica Carter, and this is my story. Imagine a journey through the night, more specifically, a bus full of teenagers on an overnight ride. Our destination, Grand Rapids, Michigan. We are excited because in a few short months, we would be going on a Rotary Youth Exchange. Everyone knew where they would be posted. Everyone except one of us, me. It is June 2006, and I am the last student in the district to be assigned a host club, and I was about to receive some shocking news. Stepping off the bus, I rubbed the sleep out of my eyes and heard a warm bellow. Carter! Jessica Carter! That's me, I said as I approached the caller. I just received word. You're going to Cheetah, Russia, and he thrust an envelope into my hands. I should have been ecstatic. I had been accepted into this amazing program, and finally, I knew where I'd be spending the next year of my life. But there was just one problem. Where is Cheetah? I asked the Rotarian. No idea, kid. Better head to the library. Oh, did I mention? Smartphones weren't a thing in 2006. I couldn't just whip open Google Maps on the spot. So, I went to the library. I found an atlas, yes, it was that old school, and looked up Chita. Chita isn't central. In fact, this small city is nowhere near Moscow. It's closer to China, located just above the Mongolian border. Chita, I discovered, was in, wait for it, Siberia, where the Russians sent people into exile. I was going about as far away from home as I could get. Little did I know that one year abroad in Siberia was going to be one of the greatest adventures of my life. How did I find myself with the gift of going on a Rotary Youth Exchange? I had grown up hearing and learning about Rotary. My dad has been a Rotarian for over 25 years. Growing up, we frequently hosted exchange students and I knew that I wanted to do the same ever since I was 10 years old. No matter how much research and preparation I did, nothing could really prepare me for stepping off the plane and into an experience of a lifetime like that. I stepped off the plane after about 16 hours of air travel, after a stopover in Europe, and then in Moscow. The weather was overcast. They allowed smoking on the plane between Moscow and Chita. I think I ate chicken or meat on the plane because I could not speak any Russian. But I was amazed to see that a whole group had gathered to welcome me, including my first host family. I got the opportunity to live with three different families and each one was very unique and all welcomed me warmly into their home. My first host family lived in an apartment building about a 20 minute walk from the central city square. Let's just say the entrance looked very Soviet. The front door didn't lock. Dogs frequently slept in the main lobby due to the door being open, and the flat I was staying in was five floors up with no elevator. My first host mother was very protective. She spoke little to no English, but knew a couple of words, and she used them when I remember being invited out for pizza by friends from school and not being allowed to go because two of the girls were bad girls, according to my host mother. Like any teenager, I was furious. This was my chance to make friends. It all worked out for the best. I made a lot of friends in Chita, and I stayed away from the bad girls. My second host family lived three blocks away from my first home in a much smaller apartment. My bed came out of a closet every night and was put back in the morning. It might not have been what I was used to at home, but the family made me feel so welcome, it didn't matter where I slept. My second host mom was always cooking, mostly high carb dishes, pasta, pirmeniki, pierogi, vereniki. I think I ate a full meal every two to three hours and I gained weight. 
Rotary had warned me that I would gain between 15 and 30 pounds while abroad. I cleared that easy, but no regrets. The last host family was in a higher economic bracket. They owned a popular restaurant and nightclub in the city and actually lived in a house outside of town. At the third host family's home, I had to take a little bus or marshutka home from school each day. I would have to bellow, stop here, at the driver. I immersed myself wholeheartedly in the people, the place, and the culture. I went to school, I was in Chita, and studied Russian language and culture. I only knew a few words of Russian before I left, and so got to learn and practice Russian with the students, host families, and friends. I would get tested from time to time. In particular, my younger host brother in my third home insisted on teaching me random words, like trampoline. Where was I going to use that? I did a lot of things I have never done before. I went camping in the dead of winter, and remember, this is Siberia, that means it's cold, and walked across a frozen lake to meet with ice fishermen. I got to visit Beijing, China for New Year's with a Russian tour group. I got my belly button pierced, sorry mom. And I got to travel coast to coast in Russia, the biggest country in the world. And even my own mother joined me for a couple of weeks. That was pretty awesome. My last night in Siberia ended in a way that I will never forget. I went to my prom in Chita. All of my host parents and families came out for the most epic goodbye party I could have ever dreamed of. We danced the night away and my host mother came to pick me up as the sun was rising so I could finish packing and catch my flight to Moscow. Everyone came out to the airport to say goodbye. They told me that I may have had a Canadian heart, but now I had a Russian soul. They were right. I look back at my time in Siberia with only the most heartwarming of memories. I learned tremendous things about myself and what I am capable of. I deepened my values of trust, respect, and resilience. The confidence I gained in myself supported me in moving forward to seize and shape my own future in the coming years. There is no question, the year of my Rotary Youth Exchange was the year that I grew up. Thank you so much to Rotary. And thank you so much, Jessica. You're making me almost want to visit Cheetah, especially for the food. That sounds delicious. So our second speaker, he's actually on the line, but because his, uh, his internet connection might be a little bit uh, unstable, we've pre-recorded his story. So let me introduce you to a gentleman who I came to know uh, for this exercise, and he has, he has he's inspired me beyond belief. And he, he says that he would never have had the life that he has created for himself without the help of generous funding and support from, Rotary, from his Rotary Club. So I'm going to introduce you now to Christopher O'Meara and Brian, you're going to run the tape. Hi everyone, my name is Christopher O'Meara and this is my story. I was born in a small village in the western part of Kenya. I grew up in a humble and a poor background. My parents struggled so hard to bring food on the table. They didn't go to school. They didn't know how to read and write. They had no job. They worked so hard to give us the best that they could, as all other parents would. The level of uh, illiteracy in my village was standing at 98 when I was growing up. The nearest school in my village was about 10 kilometers away. Most kids could not do that work. So most kids either started school when they were old or never went to school. For me, I looked at the 12% that were doing well, the 12% that were illiterate, and I wanted to be like them. And I knew very well that the only thing that was going to get me out of the cycle of poverty and illiteracy was education. So one day, instead of going to the farm and coming back looking after animals, which was the order of the day, I went to school. I took the walk to that school that was 10 kilometers away. I didn't know the procedure. I thought you just walked in and started learning. When I got there, 
I looked into a classroom where there were young kids and I went there, talked to the teacher. The teacher told me that I was too old for that uh, class. So I, told, I didn't take this lying down. I told the teacher in anger that age does not matter. I wanted just to know how to read and write. This caught the attention of the head teacher who called me into his, his office and told me that, young lad, those kids you see there, most of them don't have a dream. Most of them don't have a goal, but you have a goal. I will help you realize your dream. All I want you to do, go back home and come back here with your parents tomorrow. I ran back home and went back home to tell my mama who was still in the field. I told her I had gone to school and the headmaster needed us to go to school tomorrow with her. She welcomed the idea. The next day at, fa at 3 a.m. I was up and starting to prepare to go to school. We left my home at 5.30. By 6.30 we were at the school. We waited for the headmaster until 8 o'clock. We waited for two hours. The head teacher got in, called us into his office and admitted me into grade one. I went into that classroom. Other kids were laughing at me because I was old for that classroom. I sat in front alone, but I wanted just to know how to read and write. As the days went, I did well in the school. The kids started respecting me, and I finished my education and uh, went to primary school, went to secondary school, went to the best high school, and went to university. And... Uh, Graduated at the university with the Bachelor of Science in Education Biochemistry and started lecturing at one of the colleges in Kenya. But my passion for education didn't end there. And my prospects for furthering my education in Kenya was almost nil. I was looking outside Kenya. I was lucky enough uh, with my effort and the effort of my parents and that of the Catholic Church, I secured a visa to come to Canada. And I came to Canada, went to Sarnia and joined Lambton College School of Nursing. One year down the road, I got a call. A call that anyone would dread getting. It was like a stone had fallen on my chest. I'd never heard from my parents for... Uh, Quite a while, I knew everything was going on, on okay. But my parents, in, in essence, my parents had been sick. And that call was to let me know that my parents had died. My father died first, then followed by my, immediately followed by my mother. Ladies and gentlemen, that was hard on me. But that didn't end there. I lost my funding too. I was not able to pay rent and I was expected to leave the school. So at that point, I, was, I saw my future falling apart right in front of my face. I had no one to turn to. I didn't know anybody in North America or in Canada. But ladies and gentlemen, Life is a journey, and in life, you will get people who will come in your life at the right time when you hit the rock bottom to encourage you and lift you up and help you continue. Rotary Club Sanya Blue Water through Tanya Wolf came into my life at the right time when I really needed somebody to help me. Tanya Wolf worked tirelessly with the Rotary, members of the Rotary Club, Sanya Blue Water, to secure me a scholarship. A scholarship that was a game changer in my life. This scholarship enabled me to stay in the School of Nursing for one year. After that one year, I acquired enough skills to get a job as personal support worker at Ladies and gentlemen, sleep was a dream for me because I worked 
during the night and went to school during the day. There are times if I was lucky, I got two hours of sleep. I worked so hard and graduated at, uh, from the School of Nursing on a Dean Honor List with straight A's and became a registered nurse. Right now, I'm working with the federal government of Canada as a registered nurse in advanced clinical practice, specialized in primary health care and community health. We are entrusted with delivering primary health care to Aboriginals living in remote and isolated communities in northern parts of Canada. A job that I love dearly and is quite rewarding. Without the help of Rotary Club, I would have not been where I am right now. The education whose foundation was laid by the scholarship from the Rotary Club has helped me as an individual to succeed beyond my parents and break the cycle of poverty and illiteracy. And that has gone beyond me. My nephews and nieces, all of them are literate. They all know how to read and write, and most of them have university degrees. Some are also lecturers at the university because they saw me as a role model, and I was also able to help them pay for their education. This is not ending within my family. I have two beautiful children and I've fostered lots of children in Kenya. Do you know what I will hand them over? Not illiteracy, not poverty, but I will hand them over success and literacy. Without the help of the Rotary Club, this would have not been possible. I've also initiated various projects to help lift up the living conditions of the people in my village. We have put up a school where kids don't have to walk 10 kilometers the way I did. And on top of that, they get breakfast, something that I, I just wished and dreamed when I was growing up. My story, fellow Rotarians, is a testimony to the world that Rotary Club is making a huge difference in the life of individuals, families, communities, and nations. Rotary is touching life indiscriminately. And with those few remarks and that story of my life, I want to thank all of you for turning my life around, for being there when I needed help, May the good Lord bless what you do and bless all of you. Thank you. Such an inspiring man. Such an inspiring story. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it should be added that Chris has received the Premier's Award for Ontario, uh, recognizing his dedication to improving the lives of so many people, both in Canada and in Kenya. And he is one of our frontline heroes right now. He's working during the COVID crisis as a community health care nurse in First Nations communities offering primary care. And that's where he is today. And he's on the line. So maybe he can wave at us all. So thank you, Chris. I could hear that story again and again. Okay, last but not least, another young woman, also from this area, but who now lives in St. Stephen, New Brunswick. And she's going to delight us with how Rotary has shaped her life and also for her passion for the color purple. Take it away, Kaylin. Oh, hello there. My name is Kaylin Nutt, and this is my story. I love the color purple. This is a good thing because when I was 17, I found myself rounding up all of the purple things that I owned and heading to London, Ontario for a weekend that would change my life. 
I was 17 in grade 11 at the local high school in Port Elgin, Ontario, and I had been lucky enough to be selected by the Southampton Rotary Club to join other young people in my age group to attend Rotary Seminar for Tomorrow's Leaders. This is a conference that is designed to help young leaders get the new skills and experiences that they need to develop their leadership skills. Each year about 100 delegates are selected and of these delegates, they're all split up into six groups and each group is designated a color. That year, I was purple. So I'm gonna take you back there. I dove right in. I grabbed my purple morph suit, which is this thing here, and I helped my teammates decorate our breakout room with everything that we could find that was purple. And I shared with them my love of the song, Purple Rain by Prince. You are me in a conference now. This seminar has really impacted me. I've been able to go back for the last 10 years uh, as not a delegate anymore, but as a member of the leadership team. And if I'd been able to go this year, if we'd been able to host the seminar, I would have once again been a leader of the purple team. That's my purple shirt and all the purple stuff here. It was just one weekend, but as I said, it's been one of the most influential weekends of my life. So I'm just gonna bring you into some of my times there. There were so many activities at this seminar that took our ability to be leaders and tested those skills in all kinds of situations. One such activity was called the blind lunch. So I'm going to take you back to that. The, we were all in our breakout rooms and our leaders asked for volunteers. The seven people that put up their hands were handed blindfolds and asked to tie them over their eyes. In other words, they were blindfolded. It was lunchtime and the only directions that we were given were to go to lunch and come back to the breakout room after, which seemed pretty normal. Then the leaders left and I'm sure you can imagine it, there was chaos. The blindfolded individuals were panicking about how they would get down to the lunchroom, which was some distance away and involved hallways and stairs and elevators. The rest of us, myself included, were thrilled that we did not have to be in their shoes. But then it dawned on us that maybe we needed to help our blindfolded friends. So I latched onto Emily from the Listable Rotary Club, grabbed her arm, and started leading her down the hallway, describing what I was seeing along the way. When we got to the cafeteria, I suddenly realized that everyone was doing this activity. There were 50 blindfolded delegates trying to get their lunch. They were hungry, and they were scared. Emily and I had to navigate the lunch line, which involved describing what options were available and how much she might want. I made the choice to get her food and get her seated at the table first, and then I went back and got my own. But then came the complicated task of helping her navigate her plate. After lunch, we all went back up to the breakout room. It was a really, really clever exercise. It was all about helping people who don't have the same advantages as we do and helping them to succeed. There were so many other activities that challenged our leadership skills in really engaging ways. And now as a member of the leadership team, I find it is such a compelling way for young leaders to experience leadership. I have taken what I learned then and what I am still learning now to help me in my life and with the choices that I continue to make. It has really helped my confidence and this has helped me in my work. I have done everything from teaching kids about nature to baking to working as a teller at Scotiabank, which is what I'm doing now. 
I really want to thank Rotary for this experience. Not every young person has the ability to join other young leaders for a weekend to learn how to better develop their leadership skills so that they can bring that back into their own lives and the lives of others. It has been such a huge part of my life and I am eternally grateful. Thank you. And thank you, Kaylin. <laughs> I love the color purple too. <laughs> so and thanks to all three of you for telling your stories. We're getting quite a bit of reaction here on the chat line. So uh, they're all such beautiful stories and really show the power of Rotary. And this is the power of Rotary and the impact that it's had on their lives. And of course, you all have so many stories like this to tell. So remember what I said earlier is that great storytelling can be learned. I worked and mentored Jessica, Chris, and Kaylin through a process where they've really learned how to shape information about their story that normally would have been maybe a couple of lines on their club website. And we've shaped it into a compelling story. And these are the kind of stories that people want to hear because they inform, teach, and engage, and influence people about the power of Rotary. Now, the other thing people are asking, you know, the, these three stories, we've actually uh, pre-recorded all of them as well. So they are in video form, which means they can be posted and they'll probably be posted on the website, Facebook page, sent out in an email list, all sorts of things. I'm sure you can all get access to them. But that's kind of the point is that, you know, right now there's never been a better time for you to tell uplifting, hopeful, inspiring stories and to spread the word about Rotary. Uh, and the work that you do, because uh, it can also help refresh and rejuvenate your image and your brand. And so to give you a little practice, we are launching uh, what we call, what we're calling the $1,000 Success Storytelling Challenge to all of you. And so here's how it's going to work. We're going to ask or invite any of the Rotary Clubs and Rotaracts to think of one great story that you could tell. You know, pick a cause, a service project, a person who's been impacted like the three of these people, and prepare a short story. And then you can create a video, maybe just using your phone if that's the easiest way to do it. Um, and have one of your members or a group or whatever, be as creative as you want. And matter of fact, the more creative, the better, because there's the prize, $1,000. Our committee will review the videos over the next two weeks. And uh, we're giving you two weeks to do it. And uh, we'll donate $1,000 to the Rotary Club with the best story. So, and as I said, I'll always also be providing a two-page storytelling model, which is what the three of my speakers used um, to help them shape their stories into winning stories. And keep in mind, there are no losers here. If you take advantage of this challenge, you will already have one story to tell and post and it will give you, open the door for you to do so much more. So I hope I've given you some things to think about, and I look forward to seeing your stories. And if you need help with any of your stories, you can always contact me. So thank you again for this opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. And thank you, Diana, Jessica, and, and Chris, and Kay. Awesome. You couldn't have picked better guests and we couldn't have had a better presentation. Thank you. And I'd like to doubly thank Diana. Remember three months ago, we said we didn't know how to do this, but we were sure there was a way. Chris and Brian have helped us get here. We didn't also know what to do. Diana was instrumental in help us, helping us tell our story and getting the message out. So Diana will be forever thankful for that. And we're forever excited about the $1,000 Story Challenge. The information, as you mentioned, is posted on our website, how to do it, what to do, and we look forward to hearing those entries. And we have another story to tell, or retell in one case. You heard from Jessica how exciting she was to be a Rotary Youth Exchange student. This year's Rotary Youth Exchange, like all of them, is different every year. This year, imagine thinking of Jessica, but halfway through, COVID-19 comes. We want to welcome our current youth exchange students, some who are still here, most who've gone home early, all with a story and adventure to tell, um, not the story we hope they would be able to tell, but a story nonetheless. So right now, we're going to hear from our 
Rotary Youth Exchange students. Moi, my name's Robert and I'm from Finland. I'm sure that I'm from Japan. Yeah. Hola, my name is Duda and I'm from Brazil. Cześć, my name is Helena and I'm from Poland. Hola, my name is Mateo and I am from Chile. Hola, I'm Maho and I'm from Venezuela. Bonjour. It is life changing. It means a lot of new friendships. It means love. Exchange is a big challenge. For me, exchange means grow up and get mature. It is so much fun. It is such a great experience. It gives you a really big family. And sometimes it can be hard. Homesickness. And you can find some really hard moments. But there are always more good moments. Well, there you have it, a year in the life of uh, our youth exchange students. Rotary is very proud of the youth exchange program, which is one of the largest youth exchange programs of its type in the world. And as you've heard, it's both life changing for the students, but, host, but also for the host families who welcome in, them into their own homes. But normally, uh, on a day like this, we, our youth exchange students would be with us and they would bring along a parade of flags and a presentation. However, what we can say and we do have is the writer, director of the video, Matteo, is from Chile and he's currently being hosted by the Rotary Club of Walkerton. So welcome Matteo. Hi guys, nice to meet you everyone. I'm so happy to be here. So thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> thank you Matteo for joining us. I've just got a couple of questions for you. Um, sure. uh, tell me how you went about producing the, uh, the video. So I'm not gonna lie, it was not easy at all. Like we were already like some of the, some of the exchange students, they were already at home. So it was kind of hard to like take all the exchange students and make a big video with all the like all the people. So actually we couldn't, but we did like the best as we can. And I don't know, like we wanted to show like how the exchange is, how like our year is. We didn't get the best year ever, but. We had a good time anyway, so so yeah, we were just wanted to show like everything that an exchange is for us. So that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, so tell me what you've enjoyed most about being in Canada. The people, the people in Canada. I don't know, like my friends, my host families, the Rotarians, everything. I just like I think the Canadians are the nicest people in the world. Like as as i know right now they they are just so nice and i'm so happy with my friends right now here in canada so definitely the people yeah and conversely what's the least thing you liked about canada 
if you ask me that questions like i don't know what two months ago i would like to say covid but right now i don't know if that's my answer i learned like a lot from covid um so honestly like i don't have like the thing that i like the least it's just like of course an exchange is not always easy but i just always keep the good memory so right now i couldn't tell like one thing that i don't like about my exchange that's great that's lovely to hear um so what have you missed though from chile mm, my family of course and i don't know the winter honestly your winter is so cold and so snowy guys so i was kind of having a hard time like walking to school in the morning sometimes so so yeah your winter is really cold for me in my city which like it's just rainy but that's all we don't get snow so so what would the temperatures be typically in winter with you in my city we could get like i don't know zero degrees but that's like the coldest that we can get so it's not like you that you can get like minus 23 like celsius so okay yeah that was a big change for me honestly <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you to give one piece of advice to a, uh, an exchange student going uh, uh, leaving uh, canada or leaving your country again what would it be this is a hard question because I know that every experience is so different. So I can just select from my point of view and from my experience and the experience that I had here. So I don't know. It's like, I think you should go like just to like wanting to learn and like wanting to get good experiences. And of course, it's not always going to be easy. You're not going to be always happy. You can get some homesickness. You can get, you can get like, I don't know, like sad uh, moments too, but you had to learn from them. You had to be always like wanting to learn, always wanting to try to find something to do, trying to like, trying to meet people. So yes, you just have to be like open-minded and try the best as you can. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. Thank you guys. Uh, for representing you and your fellow uh, exchange students. Uh, and it just shows when it comes over like this what a great program it is. Uh, but a program like this uh, cannot function without a great dedicated team who support it. And I want to give a big shout out to Don Bork and the District Youth Exchange team for their tremendous commitment to keeping both our inbounds and outbounds uh, safe in this very uncertain time because it's been a very challenging year for them. Unfortunately, I have to say that uh, the program is going to be on hold for a year while during the COVID-19 crisis, but we're going to try and reinvigorate, reinvent the program for next year. And we want, uh, so anybody out there who's thinking about being a host family or wants to participate in the following year, feel free to get in touch with us because this is a great program which we want to continue and uh, keep building on. So once again, thank you, Matteo, for representing really well your fellow uh, students. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Thank you. Take care and safe trip home to Chile because I think you're going back. Tell me when you're going back. I'm going back on June 25th. Yes. That's right. Oh, well, anyway, safe travels and don't forget to keep in touch with us. Yeah, of course. Thank you, guys. <laughs>